Tov, Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Very interesting uh, things happening around the globe tonight, uh, starting with Russia, according to the Independent News. Several other news sources as well are reporting Putin orders Russian Air Force to prepare for time of war. They were in a military snap check, as Russia calls it, all across the country, including moving uh, into uh, Moscow there, the S-400 defense system there, just to see if the Air Force uh, is really ready. There were some 40,000, I believe, uh, uh, military personnel in the snap check drill. They were ready, armed, locked, and loaded all across the nation. And of course, this is happening more and more around Russia because Russia, no doubt, is starting really to feel the heat by NATO uh, surrounding on every side of their country. And it is continually uh, raising the provocation level. Uh, of course, NATO claims that they're doing it because they call Russia the aggressive force and claim that Russia is the one that is provoking the conflict in Ukraine uh, against Petro Poroshenko. And yet at the same time, Kiev's own state's attorney official found a document that stated that uh, former President Yanukovych had requested Russia as an invitation to come in to help his nation because he feared they would fall into civil war. And if that be the case, which we've seen the document, shared it here on Israeli News Live as well, if it is an authentic document, then it kind of sheds new light on Russia's presence inside of eastern Ukraine or even in Crimea for that matter. Another interesting uh, uh, interview that came out that we listened to earlier today, uh, 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 Amin Poor on CNN was interview, interviewing Le Pen, uh, who is running for prime minister or president of France right now. Uh, though from where, what we understand, she's not doing so well in the polls, but nonetheless, she was also calling for the lifting of sanctions on Russia and claims that Crimea has always been a part of Russia. And historically, she's correct on that. But I'm, I'm an poor did not want to really give her the opportunity to really respond without interrupting her. Kind of reminded me of a witch hunt, if you ask me. Seems like Amin Empor had already gone in with a fixed opinion on the interview, was just there to kind of slam the uh, presidential hopeful uh, candidate, Le Pen, to begin with. Anyway, just kind of a thought we'd share with you there. Moving on as well, like I said, Russia doing all of the drills here, but NATO also not slowing down a single bit with moving things around as well. And in the uh, the latest movement for the Atlantic Resolve, NATO is now moving U.S. military tanks down to Romania. Again, uh, that is part of making sure keeping Russia in check on the southern side of Ukraine if in the event there becomes an escalation of violence beyond that what the, uh, the separatists are able to deal with and Russia decides to come to the aid of, his, of their own ethnic Russian uh, people to back them. Uh, that could very well spiral out of control. I wanted to share a little bit with you here on Twitter here. If you just put in Atlantic Resolve, uh, we have here U.S. Army 120-millimeter 120 round is fired from uh, M1A2 uh, tank there. That's in, uh, in Poland that that's happening there. We see that uh, the U.S. Polish tanks side-by-side side in Zagan. Uh, we see um, uh, the 1st Battalion, 68th Armored Regiment, test firing at a range in Poland near Zagan again. Uh, we, we have... Um, um, let's see, that's Polish as well. Uh, we, we have a lot of different troop movement going on, though. If you just put in uh, Atlantic Resolve here, uh, we see Estonia, U.S. soldiers, M2A3 Bradley fighting vehicles, and M1A2 Abram tanks arrived in to support the Atlantic Resolve. Uh, you can just go through here, and it's just everywhere on Russia's border. More and more troops, more and more equipment. We see the buildup also in Norway. Um, and it, it's just, it's not slowing down. And I was really myself hoping that once President Trump got into office, uh, we might see some of this back down and that we might avert a war. But the more I watch things as they're uh, progressing here, the more concern I have that it's not going to slow down. Um, also, we hear in another article here, uh, President Putin uh, is disagreeing with Trump on labeling Iran the number one terrorist state. I know even Israel feels that Iran is the number one terrorist uh, threat uh, that they face as well. 
And it really comes down to a Sunni-Shi'i divide. And that's what's interesting. The Vatican themselves have always kind of been the backer of the Sunni uh, group, uh, Arab groups that are around the, the world there. This is why you see NATO siding with Sunnis such as Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, other nations like that. But any of the pro-Shiite uh, nations, which by the way, Syria happened to have been one of those nations there, then the U.S. is very much against those nations. And I don't say that Tehran is some knight in shining armor. They threatened that any kind of attack on them, they would immediately retaliate on Israel. Well, whatever come to standing up for your own self-defense there. If, if the United States attacks Iran, then why doesn't Iran fight the battle with the United States? And no doubt, if that did come to that, it could drag Russia into the conflict as well, because Iran and Russia do carry very close ties. Of course, Iran does help arm and fund Hamas and Hezbollah as well, which is some of Israel's greatest enemies. And of course, we see the Yemenis uh, conflict that is going on where the Saudis have been hammering these people to a near oblivion. In fact, one of the greatest humanitarian crises in the world today happens to be in Yemen, where children literally are starving to death. It is a tragedy of what's going on there, but nonetheless, the United States administrations, both Obama and now President Trump, have failed to stop backing uh, the, the, the constant bombing on this country. Not to say that it didn't start off with, a, with an issue to begin with, with the Houthis, but clearly it is a divide. And speaking about uh, President Trump calling the Iran the number one terrorist state, which I agree there's a lot of terrorism they do and a lot that they support. But did he forget about Turkey and Saudi Arabia as well? This article here from 2015, Turkey and Saudi Arabia alarmed the West by backing Islamic extremists. The Americans had bombed in Syria. I didn't think it would surprise President Barack Hussein Obama at all. In fact, I'm sure he was right along there with, uh, with them funding it, but just had to look good more for the American public that, oh my gosh, can't believe they're supporting these terrorists, which we find out from Aaron Erdem, the parliament member of Turkey that exposed Erdogan's involvement in smuggling in the sarin gas to use on the Syrian population only to blame it on Bashar al-Assad. In fact, probably if there's any leader there in the Middle East that was probably the, the decent leader of all these leaders in the Middle East, I would have had to put my money on President Bashar al-Assad. And the reason I say that it's because he was the one president that was tolerant to both Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and as well as Sunni and Shias. It's the only country in the Middle East that I am aware of that actually were able to coexist together, much like what we see in the United States. Of course, those that did coexist together would tell you there wasn't much freedom of expression as far as like in journalism. You still were limited on what you could say, but at least they could get along with their neighbors. Well, couldn't have that. Hussein Obama there, president, former president of the United States, President Barack Hussein Obama, decided to end all of that. Anyway, moving on as well, and speaking about the situation with Iran, uh, President Trump has wasted no time with uh, working together with uh, England and France, sending in 17 U.S. and uh, allied warships there uh, in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, of course, they say it was not to show their muscle to the Iranian uh, groups there, but clearly it was an indication to Iran, we are here, we are ready, and as they speak about the Atlantic Resolve, they are resolved. If it takes a war, they're going to do a war. That kind of reminds me of another issue as well. I figured I'd share with you tonight on Czech television and the Czech news there. They were sharing, the Czech TV had actually interviewed Henry Kissinger. One of the things that was interesting, of course, Henry Kissinger was speaking English and so was the interviewer, but they were overriding it with the translations, uh, uh, you know, verbal translations in Czech there. My wife and father-in-law both listened to it, and one thing that really surprised them was the interviewer guy didn't really want to go into Donald Trump very much. Henry Kissinger said, why not? I'm one of his main advisors. And so they did talk about President Trump. The sad thing is, though, that doesn't really make sense to me if you think about all this. He's also a major close friend of President Putin. Goes to his own private resort. 
If he's a close friend of President Putin, good friend of President Trump, and a close advisor, as he has claimed to be, not to mention, he spoke in the interview about how that the first Czech president after the collapse of the Soviet Union did not want anything to do with NATO. But he said within a year we had him convinced that he needed to be a part of NATO. Just makes you wonder. This is the man that is the father of the new, or the architect he has been called of the New World Order. Is part of the New World Order really to start a war between the superpowers? From my own intel that I have gathered from people that are in the know on this, one journalist shared with me that that's exactly what they intend to do. A war between Russia, the United States, and eventually China as well to bring down the superpowers to actually say that nationalism has failed us. We need a new world order. If there's ever been a time where God will have to send the two witnesses to straighten out a mess like this, this is about the time I think we need it. Same thing, even in Israel, we're seeing that Israel, the, the, the fighting now is beginning to, to really gain momentum as yet another rocket falls inside of Israel. No one was hurt, no one was harmed, but Israel does retaliate with a very heavy hand. And bombing of many of the Hamas uh, places has taken place yet again today. Of course, Israeli officials are saying they're expecting a war with Hamas at any time now. No doubt, probably will. Especially when you retaliate this heavily, we can count on a war being brewing up any time soon without a doubt. Uh, moving on else as well, the United States, according to uh, Sputnik News, U.S. Senators introduced a bill requiring Congress approval for lifting anti-Russian sanctions. Talk about Lindsey Graham worried about sanctions happening, being lifted on Russia without his approval. He is part of a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators led by, of course, Republican Lindsey Graham and Democrat Ben, ben Cardin introduced legislation granting Congress a veto right over any decision by President Donald Trump's administration to lift any anti-Russian sanctions. You know, one thing I'm really watching, th this is blowing me away. It's the first time in the history of a president that I've actually seen the authority of Congress, senators, federal judges that are exercising their power over the president, and every time they're winning. No wonder why the nation is spiraling out of control. No matter how much the Christian community came together to help put President Trump in there, the patriots that came together to put Trump in office, the nationalistic spirit that rose up to put President Trump into office has been greater than any other time. And yet at the same time, I have never seen so much effort by the, what do you call it, the far left, trying to topple a presidency. And by different individuals, judges, senators, congressmen, trying to override everything that is said and done by the President of the United States. I don't say I agree with everything that Trump is doing either, but it concerns me that the United States is headed for a major civil unrest. Today I was speaking with a person in the United States and I asked, actually it was brought up to me, I didn't even ask to start with, but I asked about it afterwards, but I was being told that even in the little city of Fort Myers, uh, Florida, there have been protests and unrest. And the person shared with me that everywhere, everywhere around the nation is continual protest, rioting, etc. That it is spreading more and more and more. You know, the only thing I can see next, the people, if the people of America do not come together and work together with peace and harmony, you're going to give way to martial law. And I, I don't see any other way around it. And, I, and, the, and the sad thing is, is people like George Soros no doubt wants that. You know, it's kind of interesting. You ever think about that? And I'm sure many people have already put this together. George Soros, what did Yeshua say after you see the wars and rumors of wars? He said, these are the beginning of sorrows. Maybe George Soros is kind of a biblical sign for us all. Never thought about that one before, but something that came to me the other day. I don't know, maybe it's just a little pun idea, who knows, but anyway, 
Uh, also, Army, and by the way, this is another reason why I bring this up about uh, uh, dealing with martial law, because the Army preps for urban warfare in mega cities, mass migration, disaster, and inner city turmoil. This is uh, on uh, shtfplan.com. It's a new source I've never actually looked at before, but it uh, says there will be war in the streets of America. Things have been engineered that way. The scenarios are many. The issues are complex. The current anger from the left, who are violently protesting against uh, President Trump, is just one aspect of it. But the Pentagon and the U.S. national security structure is increasingly looking towards the shifting demographics around the globe. People have moved from rural areas and shifted into the cities. Wherever conflicts, there will be a need for military and SWAT response to the call. That's just not good. And the other thing, too, that I keep seeing as well is that President Trump continues to do executive orders, things that are just, I, I realize he's trying to do things what he believes to be in the best interest of the nation, but some of these are clearly only adding fuel to the fire, even. And I brought this out not long ago. I got slammed by a lot of our Christian friends over saying this, that he, he went ahead and signed an executive order to get the, uh, uh, the pipeline going again in Dakota. The Dakota Pipeline. Many people said, no, brother, he's, he's rerouting it. But according to the latest information that just came out on this, not only has it been approved, but yes, it's still going right under the waterway, which has inflamed the uh, Native Americans, the indigenous people there, the Sioux tribe as well, enraged them greatly because after they had finally won against President Obama, he does it anyway. And I'm just concern, friends. You know, are, are some of these things intentional? you got to remember, I shared with you that direct information that we had back when Obama was president, that they were looking for an excuse to bring about martial law to disarm the nation, according to the United Nations document that demands that Americans must be disarmed. You ever think that maybe there's just somebody playing along with this game? I mean, I certainly hope not. And it may not be President Trump himself, maybe it's those that he's surrounded by, but he doesn't realize that they're leading him in that direction. I'm just trying to give benefit of the doubt in that regards there. Let's move on as well. Ukrainian blogger, this is something that really bothers me as well here. I saw this today, um, and uh, uh, a lot of things are still happening. There's still The war is still raging over there in Ukraine, in the eastern part of Ukraine, and it's Ukrainian city, citizens on both sides. Friends. That's what's really sad. Petro Poroshenko trying to stop what he calls the uprising of those that are in the far east there, uh, but they are ethnic Russians. You know, these people have been part of the Russian Federation, their families and families and families' families. And they know that if they don't stand up and defend themselves, they would easily be annihilated uh, by the pro-Ukrainian, the, the more of the fascist way of thinkers that are coming uh, from the western part of Ukraine. Uh, and so we get things like this one here. The Ukrainian blogger states ethnic Russians in Donbass must be burnt in gas chambers. This is why these people are trying to defend themselves. It's this type of rhetoric that has the Ukrainian people in eastern Ukraine, fearful if they lose this battle, they'll be overrun and pretty much genocide out of existence. Um, another one of uh, Ukraine's great leaders here, uh, they call him Gibby. Uh, he was killed in a, uh, in, in a um, what they're calling a terrorist attack that took place uh, uh, earlier today, uh, he was uh, a bomb was planted inside of his office. When he went into his office, um, uh, the bomb went off, killing him. Uh, so I, I assume instantly, from the looks of the way the bomb went off and everything, uh, he was very notorious and very much wanted to be killed by the Ukrainian government. Uh, I have seen footages of him interrogating uh, the Ukrainian soldiers that he captured. Man, he was definitely a ruthless individual there. Uh, so I can certainly see why they wanted to target him to begin with. Uh, but nonetheless, he was trying to fight for uh, the separatists uh, and, and for their cause there against the Ukrainian government, uh, as they call them, the Ukrops is the name that they're given by the uh, Donetsk uh, People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic as well. 
So there's been a lot of assassination. That's the third assassination by the Ukrainian government thus far. And some, in some way or another, they are very successful with being able to get in and plant these bombs there. There's no doubt they have some very... Uh, close connections, even inside, uh, behind enemy lines, so to speak. The people, though, that were interviewed here clearly, though, uh, stood for the Ukrainian uh, people in eastern Ukraine there and for the separatists and believed that it only strengthens their resolve to fight and defend their lives even the more. Uh, and no doubt that may be the case there. Massive explosion rocks chemical plant in eastern China. That was just came out as we were getting our report together there. And what a plume that went up from that plant there, even higher than the sun as far as, you know, not technically that way, but uh, just reminded me so much of a nuclear explosion going off almost the way the plume went up there uh, like that. I have not followed up on this to see... Uh, just how serious it has become that the, at the first breaking of this, they had no death toll as of yet, uh, but no doubt there will be a, a, de a death toll involved in that. And of course, again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, these type homemade rockets are being fired into Israel uh, sporadically from Hamas inside of Gaza, uh, or at least the Israeli authorities, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is uh, claiming that Hamas is the one that they are holding responsible regardless for who is firing the rockets inside of Israel. And again, one thing that I have to say, though, that when Hamas is doing this, a lot of people look down on Israel because of the heavy hand, and I'm not for the heavy hand that Israel is using on Hamas as a result, but the thing is, is Prime Minister Netanyahu has always warned that there is a heavy price to play, pay when you fire these rockets into Israel. Uh, so Hamas is instigating the problem, without a doubt, and of course Israel is retaliating. Uh, but I think it's only going to escalate it even more because when Israel retaliates, no doubt there will be fatalities in their retaliation. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. It's kind of an update of things tonight. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it just seems like right now, friends, there's not a whole lot of good news to be watching. I guess if we want to really see good news, let's go out to nature and visit nature and watch the wildlife where they can live in peace and freedom. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Air of